Good morning, everybody. You can hear me all right? Great. G'day. My name's Ben. This is Jess. Welcome to Village Church this morning. An extra special welcome to you if you are seated in the auditorium at the moment. Well done. You made it here at 9.30. Fantastic. It's not a competition, but you're much better than everybody else. Good on you. And also, welcome to you if you're joining us online. You also made it. Congratulations. That is awesome. Yeah, so if you are watching us online, check in at villagechurch.sydney forward slash live. It'll be really great to say hello. Um, You can post your questions there as well. Um, We have question and comment time coming up a little bit later on. And we're going to be continuing reading the book of Romans together. And our lead pastor, Dominic Steele, will be opening up that for us a little bit later on. We're going to pray together. And uh, in a moment, we're about to sing a song. Um, But before we do that, Ben, would you lead us in prayer? Yeah, I'd love to. Would you please join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the incredible opportunity it is to gather together, be here together, to experience together the incredibleness, the wonder, the majesty, the joy, the love, the mightiness that is you and your Son, Jesus Christ, and may the power of your Holy Spirit be working in us powerfully, not just this morning, but for the rest of our lives. Amen. Amen. Would you please join us in singing our first song, Ancient of Days? Yeah, please stand. Oh, 
broken and defiled, clinging to our filth. We gloried in our shame, running far from you. Still your mercy sought and saved us. up with Christ, precious children in your eyes. You gave your only Son, your joy and your delight. Him to the cross, you crushed him for our sin. How could you love us like you love him? up with Christ. Hallelujah. We belong to you. You have washed our stain and have raised us up with Christ. Precious children in your eyes. Hey, please grab a seat. Well, good morning and welcome along to Village Church today. Whether you're here with us in the room, whether you're joining us online. And my name's Jessica. I'm one of the pastors here at Village. If uh, we haven't met before, I'd love to say hello over a morning tea a little bit later. And good morning to you as well, Ben. Good morning to you, Jess. Hey, everyone. I'm Ben. Um, we don't normally do this here at church, but today is something of a special day for at least two people here at church. One is Evan. Happy birthday to you, Evan. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's what you get and, when you come to church on your birthday. <laughs> and happy birthday to anybody else. It's your birthday as well. It's not Evan. Um, and an extra special welcome back to church for John Yates, who's sitting in the back hey, corner. John. Um, John. John's, I think, officially the longest member. He's been here the longest at mm. church. Uh, sadly, though, John hasn't been at church all of this year because of uh, COVID and restrictions and where he lives. But this is the first time John has been at church with us this Praise year, God. which is fantastic yeah. to have John back. Um, and if you are someone who is totally new, so you're not at John's end of the spectrum, you're more like in the last couple of weeks or so, great to have you with us here at church. Uh, please connect with us on the welcome.villagechurch.sydney page that you would have used as you checked in today. Let us know that you're new and we'll get in touch with you about how you can connect with us and we can connect with you get more immersed into church life in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, absolutely. And perhaps you're here today um, checking out who Jesus is or uh, reconnecting with faith. We'd love to invite you along uh, to Monday nights, Introducing God. Um, so we, we keep running Introducing God on Monday nights. So whether you're just here today um, or whether you've been coming along for a little while exploring Jesus, um, let us know if that's something that you're interested in looking into. Um, it's a place where you can you know, discuss anything that you like in terms of, you know, what could it look like to have a relationship with God um, what's this deal about Jesus? Um, so we'd love to have you along um, if that's something that you're in the middle of exploring. Something happened at church yesterday, Jess. What was it? What happened? How was it? <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, we had the women's afternoon tea here yesterday. We had about 40 women come along and just spend a good amount of time together, um, catching up, chatting, fantastic talk uh, from Jenny Denny, um, and some amazing food as well. Sounds awesome. Okay. 
that was this week. What's happening in the next couple of weeks here yeah. at Village Church? A so, bit of Village news to get through this morning, yeah, Jess. Yeah, look, it's an exciting time to be at Village. Um, in three weeks' time, we're celebrating Baptism Sunday. And praise God for the people uh, around us in our village community who have become disciples of Jesus recently. They've started to trust in Jesus. Um, and so we're really going to celebrate, um, yeah, some of the things that have been happening as people have come to trust in Jesus uh, with baptism, uh, which is really that sign of um, that you are sharing with Jesus in his death and his resurrection. Um, and it's a wonderful thing for us to celebrate together as a church community. So it'll be fantastic to have you along there for that Baptism Sunday. Um, and there might be people perhaps here today who have thought, oh, you know what, I've been a disciple of Jesus for a little while, but I've never actually been baptised. This would be a great time to be baptised. So if that is you, uh, let us know. Again, villagechurch.sydney forward slash community. That's the place where you kind of got to go for everything, really. So just remember that, villagechurch.sydney forward slash community, and let us know if baptism is something that uh, you want to know a little bit more about or that you'd like to, you'd like to do. Uh, just like... Ben and some other members of the congregation that I can see at the moment who already have their phones out. You already would have your phone out right now and you're putting in that date, which is Sunday the 5th of June. I'm sure that's what you're doing, Ben. You're punching in the 5th of June (laughs) to remind yourself that that's Baptism Sunday here at church, which is great. Um, This is also a moment as we talk about baptism here at church more prominently. If you're a parent, you might be thinking or have thought about or maybe haven't even thought about, but now you're being prompted to think about baptizing and dedicating your kids. Mm. And so if that's something that you've wondered about or you're just starting to wonder about now, because I'm saying it from the front and I'm talking to you, Dominic is hosting a session. This is very convenient, isn't it? Dominic's hosting a session after church today talking about baptizing and dedicating kids. And by after church, we mean after morning tea. After morning tea. (laughs) Around about midday, there will be a session. 11.15. 11.15. There you go. (laughs) It'll be still after morning tea. You can get morning tea first, relax, and then head on to the session with Dominic talking about baptism today at 11.15. Yeah. And so that's three Sundays' time. In two Sundays' time, Ben. So that's two. Yep, two weeks away. Okay. We're going to be joined by Michael and Rani grievous Allison. Many of you would have got to meet them Mm -hmm. at the church weekend away. They're our new overseas ministry partners. They're working with Christian Missionary Society, CMS. And they are heading off to Belgium to work with university students. And so that Sunday, two Sundays away, that I'm sure Ben's putting into his calendar and everybody else is, two Sundays away, they're going to be joining us here at church to hear more about them, but also how we can connect well with them. And if it's a dry day as well, we'll have a picnic down at uh, Jubilee Park. So it's just at the end of Johnson Street. But anyway, we'll let you know a little bit more about that um, coming up. Um, what else can? What else will they be doing? Oh, doing week? Yeah. Rani and Michael. It's a, big, be, it's a big week of Michael and They're going to be doing all week. kinds of stuff while <laughs> they're here. One of the things they're going to be doing is getting involved with the Harvest Group mm. here at church, which you may or may not have heard of. Harvest is a group of people here in our church family who are thinking about what it would look like for them to serve Jesus in ministry. So Michael and Rani are going to be speaking with them about considering ministry to gospel poor Mm. countries, places where there isn't as much access or not as much teaching or sharing of the gospel as what we get here in Australia. And they're also going to go along to Bayside Youth on Mm. Friday night. So that's going to be great fun for them. Um, But do you know what I'm particularly looking forward to, Ben? What's that, Jess? (laughs) Well, it's a thing called the Belgian feast. You're having a Belgian feast? <laughs> We're having a Belgian yes. feast. So that's on the Wednesday. And so you can really look forward to immersing yourself in Belgian cuisine um, and hearing from Michael and Rani about the need for the gospel. Um, I have a bit of a game for you, Ben. When you think Belgian cuisine, what comes to your mind? Am I allowed to say Belgian beer? Yeah. A Belgian beer comes to mind. If you're of an appropriate age and of an appropriate palate, I would recommend monastic beer from Belgium. Is okay. it Belgian beer? That's not going to be there. No, though. you're not allowed to look at the pictures on the screen at the moment because that okay. might be spoiling our game right now. Okay. But if we maybe turn the pictures off for a sec and see if Ben can guess. Um, I'm, this is a bit of a family feud game. So I'm thinking Belgian, Belgian beer wasn't on the list because I'm thinking food. Um, can you think of... Chocolate. Chocolate was the first one. Yep. Yes. <laughs> Good job. Um, okay, another Belgian food. What? Oh, they're so, giving you help. So, uh, thanks, okay. Thank you very much. I, <laughs> I didn't look like I needed so pictures. much help, but thank you. <laughs> waffles. Waffles is on the board. Yes, Belgium waffles. Hey, all right. Okay, and one last thing that you can think of for Belgium food. All right. Someone should have yelled this out already. Pom frites. Pom frites, you mean yes. fries. Yes. Yeah, Chips okay. in a bucket with mayonnaise. Fries ah. and mayo are on the board, yes. Um, but have you heard of fries and meatballs? 
No, but I, <laughs> but I wish they had. Where has that been all my life? Yeah. So fries and meatballs are potentially something you could look forward to at the Belgian feast. Is that going to be on Belgian feast? Yeah, maybe. Fries well, and... We'll see. It might be on the... Put that in your calendar. Menu, but something like that. Um, I've been looking up lots of Belgian recipes um, as we've been preparing for the Belgian feast. And if you're someone who loves cooking, um, hit me up and we would love to share the cooking load if you want to have a go at making a Belgian dish to bring along. So if you would like to make meatballs and fries, I'm sure Ben would be very grateful for that. Um, another one I've been looking up... Um, so Belgium is, is close to, um, to Holland and also to France. Um, my family background is Dutch. And so I'm excited about this next one. Um, that is a Belgian cuisine, um, but it's also something I grew up with. It's called stumpot. Um, so it's like mashed potato, and you, you have to do it like this. You've got to make like a bit of a well in the middle, so you've got a dam, and then you put gravy on the inside. And um, we used to sprinkle little bacon bits on top. Um, so anyway, that's a fun little uh, dish. Belgian people know how to cook and eat. <laughs> they sure do. That um, is the diet of champions. And I'm going to put a picture up the board, and you're, you're allowed to look at this one, Ben, okay. and try and guess what it is. <laughs> what does that look uh, like? Um, does anyone know? Uh, it oh, Tim knows it. Does it? Did it looks you hear like that, Ben? Pesto and it some like, kind of like pesto pasta. pasta something. It's not pesto pasta. It is, as Tim said, eel in green sauce. What so, eel? Eel. Yeah. yeah. Eel. <laughs> so I'm I, out. Yeah. Look, I no. I think that'll be a great one to sample. Anyway, Belgian feast. Come along. Try some eel and green sauce. You do need to register. Um, tickets are ten bucks um, to help cover the uh, cost of the food um, and any profits as well go to CMS and Michael and Rani. Um, it's five bucks for kids. Head over to villagechurch.sydney forward slash community to register for that. Uh, now, before it's time for the kids to head off to their Sunday morning fun and festivities, before that, kids, what we're going to share this morning as a church family is an update from our ministry partners in Portugal. Um, as many of you would know, Em and Sam left from Australia to Portugal in February. Here is a video update of how they're going. Hola, Village Church. Church. Emily and Samuel Lowell Ferreira here, your mission partners you are partnering with in making disciples of Jesus here in Portugal. Yeah, we've been uh, here now for about three months uh, in Portugal. Uh, this has been a time uh, for us to settle and I think we're doing uh, pretty well so far. Uh, I was in Australia for about six years, so this has been a great opportunity uh, at the moment to reconnect with family uh, and friends and churches and even to let my hair and beard grow wild. I've had the privilege of visiting and preaching at churches in my hometown of Coimbra, many of which were praying and supporting me while I was in Australia. Many of these churches are small, faithful and full of faith in the Lord Jesus. Many have decreased in size since I last remember. It's a sad reminder of the colossal need for more church leaders and pastors in Portugal. I've been taking in my surroundings and trying slash failing to drink espressos, which is a classic Portuguese beverage. Um, and I've also been learning uh, Portuguese four days a week at the local uni. It's been tough and tiring, um, but I am enjoying learning and I do feel like slow and steady progress is being made. Here's a picture of me enjoying a meal that I ordered in Portuguese using full sentences. I felt like this was a nice little milestone. It's also been great to make friends with some of my classmates and have them join Bible studies run by the local university Bible group. Some exciting news. I've been officially invited to work with the university Bible group in the capital city of Lisbon. My work with the university Bible group will involve pastoring, training and teaching university students from the Bible. We'll be moving to Lisbon in July and Emma will keep learning Portuguese there. Uh, it's been a long journey to get to this point, so we're feeling quite relieved that we're finally going to settle down uh, in Lisbon. We'd love if you could be praying for us there, uh, as we'll be going to look for a church to be part of and be serving in. Your prayers and your messages of care have gone a really long way in sustaining us and encouraging us in these first few months in Portugal. So we thank God for you uh, and the partnership that we can have in the Gospel. Until next time, adios. Bye adios. Bye. Kids, 
You've been wonderful. You've been great. It's been so great that it's now time for you to go. So Kids Church is on, dudes. Um, head towards the back doors. Parents and caregivers, the leaders, will meet them over there. If you are not a parent or you don't have kids with you, talk among yourselves. We'll be back in about a minute. That's only slightly confusing. I was going to get up and do a 10 second countdown like they do on, you know, like MasterChef, so that you know it was time to stop chatting. But I have not done that. Instead, I've talked for 10 seconds randomly. Um, so uh, it's my privilege to lead us in prayer, as the sign correctly says. And uh, so won't you join me as I pray? Lord God. <laughs> Your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. When we look at the night sky and see the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you set in place, we're astonished that you consider us to be important. But yet you love us and you have given us authority over your creation. But we know that we fall short of what, we, what you require we do not always live the way we should. Sometimes we do wrong and sometimes we do not do what is right. We can be quick to judge others, but slow to see our own faults and failings. Forgive us through the Lord Jesus and through your spirit help us to do better. Father, we thank you for the opportunity many of the women at Village had to share and hear from your word at, at Women's Afternoon Tea held here at church yesterday. We thank you for the encouragement you gave through Jenny's talk and ask that you build up everyone who attended in their relationships with one another and with you. We also pray for those from our church attending the REACH Australia conference this week. Keep them safe as they travel and help them to learn from others and grow closer to each other and to you. We ask that the lessons they learn there will serve to build up our church here in Annandale. And Father, we pray for those who make decisions that affect us all. And at this time in particular, we pray for those seeking to be elected to make such decisions in the election in just under two weeks. We pray for integrity in those who would seek to be leaders and wisdom for ourselves as we make decisions about who we should vote for. And Father, at this time when Australia is just about leading the world in per capita COVID infections, we pray for those who are sick, particularly those from among us here, that you would heal them. Help us as a church family to care for one another by providing for others' needs and being careful when we get sick. And finally, Father, we ask as we come to hear your word read and explained to us, that you would help us to hear, understand and seek to live in accord with our status as citizens of your kingdom. We ask these things so that Jesus may be glorified in all that we do. Amen. Well, in a moment, Kathy will get up and read to us from Romans 2 and 3, but before that, we're going to sing again, so please stand as we sing Unchanging.
not changing in your promises they will remain and your sacrifice is never undone for you are my faith when I Who endured suffering? You are the Lord who went to the cross and dying a sinner's death for my redemption. You are my hope and you are my song. Catherine, we're going to read the Bible together. Uh, we're reading from the beginning of Romans 2. If you would like a Bible, please put your hand up and we'll bring one round to you. Um, if you're um, reading on your devices, um, you can go to biblegateway.com um, and look up Romans chapter 2. Uh, this is quite a long reading, um, just, you know, a little bit of a warning. Okay, <clears throat> Romans chapter 2. Therefore, any one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. We know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. Do you really think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same that you will escape God's judgment? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint and patience, not recognising that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your hardness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. He will repay each one according to his works. Eternal life to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honour and immortality, but wrath and indignation to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth but are obeying unrighteousness. Affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and also to the Greek, but glory, honour and peace for everyone who does what is good, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. There is no favoritism with God. All those who sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all those who sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For the hearers of the law are not righteous before God, 
but the doers of the law will be declared righteous. So when Gentiles who do not have the law instinctively do what the law demands, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their consciences confirm this. Their competing thoughts will either accuse or excuse them on the day when God judges what people have kept secret according to the gospel through Christ Jesus. Now, if you call yourself a Jew and rest in the law, boast in God, know his will and approve the things that are superior, being instructed from the law, and if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the ignorant, a teacher of the immature, having the full expression of knowledge and truth in the law, you then, who teach another, don't you teach yourself? You who preach, you must not steal, do you steal? You who say, you must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who detest idols, do you rob their temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonour God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. For circumcision benefits you if you observe the law. But if you are a lawbreaker, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the law's requirements, will his uncircumcision not be counted as circumcision? A man who is physically uncircumcised but who fulfills the law will judge you who are a lawbreaker in spite of having the letter of the law and circumcision. For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, and true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, by the spirit, not the letter. That man's praise is not from men, but from God. Another 20 verses. Um, so what advantage does the Jew have, or what is the benefit of circumcision? Considerable in every way. First, they were entrusted with the spoken words of God. What then? If some did not believe, will their unbelief cancel God's faithfulness? Absolutely not. God must be true, even if everyone is a liar. As it is written, that you, God, may be justified in your words and triumph when you judge. But if our unrighteousness highlights God's righteousness, what are we to say? I use a human argument. Is God unrighteous to inflict wrath? Absolutely not. Otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if, by my lie, God's truth is amplified to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, just as some people slanderously claim, we say, let us do what is evil so that good may come. Their condemnation is deserved. What then? Are we any better? Not at all. For we have previously charged that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become useless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Viper's venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says speaks to those who are subject to the law, so that every mouth may be shut, and the whole world may become subject to God's judgment. For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law.
to those parents, I just wanted to say right up front to the parents, we're going to have that little meeting around 11.15. I've uh, produced a little seminar paper. I hope you'll join us and we'll talk uh, baptism and dedication, those kind of issues at 11.15 this morning uh, as part of preparing for our Baptism Sunday on the 4th of June, uh, 5th of June. Um, secondly, I just want you to know I'm a positive guy. I think I am. Uh, I think I'm an optimistic guy. And I'm just saying this just in case you're new this morning at church. If you're new, I just want you to know I'm a positive guy. Um, um, if this is the first talk you've ever heard me give, you could be forgiven for thinking at the end of this talk that I'm a negative guy. Um, I've been thinking about it in my preparation for today. I have been speaking in church for 30 years this year, and today is the most negative talk I have ever given. Just, I just want everyone's expectations to be right. <laughs> um, but as a church, we have a commitment to saying what the Bible says. And uh, as I was listening to Kath, I didn't hear a positive sentence in that reading. And so we're on a journey through Paul's letter to the Romans, and this week we're setting up the problem. Next week, it's the solution. And so can I just say, I'm hoping that next week in church, we will have our biggest attendance of the year. It would be tragic to hear this week's talk and miss next week's talk, because the two talks go together. Today is a bad news talk. Next week is a good news talk. So if you want to have a Bible open and handout so that you can find your way through the logic that we're going to be working through, because it is a complex logic. And um, uh, I just don't want you to stay down the hole. I want you to come out of the hole with us next week. Two weeks ago in church, we farewelled John Kwan from our staff team. A couple of days later, John started up at Forestville Church on Tuesday night that week. It was his kickoff service, and five of us from Village Church went up to Forestville to wish him well, to pray for him, to support him. As I drove into the car park at Forestville, I reflected, I've been here before. And I remembered back to when I'd been here before. The, and, and I had it, it was actually clearly in my brain. Because the last time I was in the car park at Forestville was mid afternoon on Sunday afternoon, the 28th of April. 1996. How do I remember so distinctly that that was the last time I was in the Forestville Church car park or the Forestville Shopping Centre car park? How do I know it was exactly that day, exactly that time? Because as I drove into the car park at Forestville in 1996, midway through that Sunday afternoon, the radio was on and they pulled the football call from the radio and they broke into the football call and broke the news about the Port Arthur massacre. And so I just have this clear memory of hearing, I mean, that confronting news of what Martin Bryant had done and was doing, and it's just etched into my brain that little moment. 35 people were killed, 23 were wounded. And in the wake of that massacre, there were all sorts of discussions in the wider Australian community about evil. And we would not be like that. We are not like that. Martin Bryant is evil. How did a gunman become... How did he become so evil? And all these articles trying to understand the psyche of what was going on in that man. And, and, and the thrust of the argument again and again in the Australian kind of public discourse then was that evil was done by somebody over there and not like us, the writers of this newspaper, the readers of this newspaper. And we became quite good at looking down at him and other people. And, and actually, it's not just Martin Bryant. We do it, don't we? I mean, people say, oh, she's so catty or he can't be trusted well, that's so stupid, only a fool would do that. Or I would die before I'd say something like that. Or he doesn't deserve a second chance. And there are lots of judgments that we make each year about other people. We find ourselves looking down our nose at others. And so I found it 
quite confronting. Um, when I listened to this interview with Tim Winton, um, great Australian author, we'll put his photo up. Um, who's, who's read a Tim Winton book? Yeah, a lot of people here. Um, this is Tim Winton speaking to Andrew Denton. Let me read it to you. My father, Tim Winton speaking, was very strict about firearms. I was in cadets. This was in the 70s and the Vietnam War, war was more or less over. Getting to be over by the stage I was in cadets. I was 14, 15, teaching other boys how to fire automatic weapons, assemble a self-loading rifle in the dark with, with a stopwatch. We were firing heavy machine guns. We were shooting at targets. We were imagining ourselves as warriors for Australia, the Commonwealth, the Queen. I don't know why, but I actually used to, sometimes when the house was empty, I used to go to my dad's wardrobe and pull out the rifle. I used to go and stand at the window and um, point the rifle at people and follow them down the street. Or certain cars, certain models of cars. But, I mean, I mean, I knew where the bullets were and I knew where the firing bolt, the mechanism that makes it into a real weapon was. And, and I was a happy kid. And later in life, as I reflected back, it sort of scared me that I'd spent this time, you know, hours and hours standing by the window, drawing a bead on my neighbours and fellow citizens. And I was a happy kid. Imagine if I was an unhappy kid. This is the, this is the bit that stopped me in my tracks. So when Martin Bryant killed all those people in Port Arthur, it was sort of a cold shudder beyond the revulsion of what happened in Tasmania. There was a shudder of recognition. And I thought, that kid could have been me. If my life had been different, if things had played out differently for me, if I'd been in some kind of turmoil, I could have shot people. It's a strange thing to recognise that about yourself and I'd been trained to kill people I knew how to do it you know I'd been firing big caliber weapons and what was I thought I was in it for the camping cadets but that's like reading playboy for the essays I knew people in jail in the 80s I did some summer schools and a little bit of work teaching, writing in jails, maximum security in the 80s, and I realised that the people in jail were just people like me who'd done things that I'd thought about because everybody thinks about doing hideous things. You know, you're kind of at the mercy of your own mind and your impulses. Now, Tim Winton is one of Australia's biggest selling authors and he's saying there how he could have been Martin Bryant and it was just astonishing listening to that interview he was so candid and honest and real about this dark side of human nature that is in him and it's the side of human nature that we normally cover up, that we normally don't show to anyone. I mean, how do you see yourself? Are you looking down at Martin Bryant? Or are you like Tim Winton, identifying with him? I mean, just, I just hear, I identify with Tim Winton. That's probably why it stopped me when I read that interview. I identify, I mean, I think... There aren't many things that I have heard of that wicked people have done that I can't see in myself the potential to do. Some I've done, some I've just thought of doing. But, but then on the other hand, I find myself being inconsistent and find myself thinking, well, oh, that is disgusting, that is appalling, and find myself looking down my nose, that is degenerate. I would not be like that. And so I find myself having this inconsistency in my thought pattern. And you now, whichever one you primarily identify as, the person who has at least in your thoughts walked down that way, or the person who looks down your nose at that, we come to Romans 2 today. 
and it's speaking. God is speaking. Paul is speaking to us. And now in this section, Romans 2, 1 through to 3.20, it's a long section. It's actually a really, really simple message, but it's quite possible to get lost in the weeds. And so big picture, what's the message of the two chapters? If, if you just flick forward to the last verse that Kathy read to us, chapter 3, 19 and 20. I'm just going to give you the summary and you'll see it there in those two verses. It's not just the Gentiles who are unrighteous, it's also the moral Jews who are unrighteous before God. By keeping the Jewish law, no one will be justified, no one is righteous, not one. We can't get right with God by our own efforts. That's the message of today. Now, little explanatory digression, the world, in terms of the worldview of people of the day, was broken up into two groups of people. There were the Jews, the people of God, and there were Gentiles. The Jews, the, the children of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the, the recipients of the promises of the covenant. God had led them through Moses out of slavery into Egypt and into the promised land. Hundreds of years of covenant relationship. God's special privileged people and the Gentiles, everyone else. And they looked down on them. Now, we saw a fortnight ago that God was angry with the Gentiles for their unrighteousness. And, I mean, they were, I'm at point three on the outline, suppressing the truth of the knowledge of God. And so the Gentiles are without excuse. And, and any Jew listening to Romans chapter 1 would have felt very comfortable with the message that we saw a fortnight ago. I mean, from the Jewish perspective, from the moral perspective, Romans chapter 1 verse 18, they'd have heard God's wrath is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And they would be thinking, the Jew would be thinking, not like Tim Winton, they would be thinking, oh, look down my nose. They would be thinking, yeah, Paul, give it to them. Those naughty non-Jewish people over there, they're not like us. We're from Texas. We support Trump. We're self-righteous. And those people over there are spiralling down into their wickedness and doing degenerate things and disgraceful things. And it is quite right, God, that you're angry with them. But, point four, the message of today is it's not just that Gentile that God is angry with. God is angry with the moralist Jew as well. Now, not many of us here are Jews but some of us are moralists. Listen to how Paul speaks. Chapter 2, verse 1, point 2a on the outline. Point uh, 4a on the outline. Therefore, every one of you who judges is without excuse. Every one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge the other, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. Now, I found this little thing. I, I don't know who wrote this. I didn't write it, but you lose your temper. You in Romans 1, where he, me, I have righteous anger. You in Romans 1, you're an inconsiderate jerk. Whereas me in Romans 2, I'm having a bad day. You have a critical spirit in Romans 1, whereas here in Romans 2, I... I bluntly tell the truth. You gossip, whereas I share prayer requests. You curse and swear, whereas I let off steam. You're pushy, whereas I'm goal-orientated. You're greedy, whereas I'm taking care of business. Verse 1 of chapter 2 of Romans. Every one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. Point B. Now, you can get caught in the weeds here, but the big picture message of this whole chapter and a half is super clear. Um, Romans 2, verse 2, God's fair in applying his justice, not just to those people over there, the Gentile, but to you 
his justice to you, the moralist. Verse 2, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on truth. Do you think any one of you who judges those things who do such things yet do the same, that you'll escape God's judgment? No, the answer is no, you won't escape God's judgment. You so-called morally upright person, you are in just as much trouble before the Almighty as the person who's done wrong and knows they're in the wrong. And the argument goes on, point C, verse 6, God is impartial. He will, 6, repay each one according to their works. You do the right thing, you get eternal life. You do the wrong thing, God's wrath, God's anger. Verse 9, there's affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew, then the Greek. But glory, honour and peace for everyone who does good, first to the Jew, then the Greek. There's no favouritism with God. If you're a Jew, you'll be judged fairly by God. If you're a Gentile, you'll be judged fairly by God. If you're immoral, you'll be judged fairly by God. If you're a moralist, you'll be judged fairly by God. The moralist Jew was expecting favoritism, was expecting privilege. But Paul says possessing the law is of no advantage. Keeping the law is what counts. I'm in verse 13. The hearers of the law are not righteous before God. The doers of the law will be justified. Now, I I think I get it, what's going on in their minds here. There's a temptation. I know the blessings of God. Sometimes I have this conversation in my head. I know the blessings of God. I have a sense of his blessing, a sense of his word, a sense of his goodness, a sense of his kindness, a sense of him revealing himself to me. I have a connection. And I'm tempted to think this little sin, it doesn't matter. I know it's wrong, but in the big picture, God, you're so gracious. You're so good. We're so tight. It doesn't matter, does it? And Paul says, you, you, you moralist, you who have the revelation, you are shamed by those over there who don't have the revelation. Verse 14, when Gentiles who do not by nature have the law do what the law demands, they're a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. The Gentile, the non-Jew, doesn't have the benefit of a thousand years of Bible teaching like you Jews. But somehow in their bones they know it's right to honour their parents. And when they honour their parents and you don't, Verse 15, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Their consciences confirm this. They live rightly, better than you, the covenant person. Now, we see this actually in Australian life at the moment. I mean, if you, I mean, I I could do it on a number of things. I mean, you could do it with Hillsong at the moment. The Christian world looks at the news stories coming out of there and hears of ego and green rooms and power imbalance. The non-Christian world hears of these things and taking advantage of vulnerable and thinks, that's wrong. That's not right. That can't be right. I say, okay, point over there. What about here? Well, I read through the history of this church and one of the ministers in the 70s left his wife and committed adultery with another man. One of the ministers in the 90s left his wife and committed adultery with another woman. So I'm not, I'm not just pointing over there, I'm pointing here. And the Gentile looks at this place with the law, with the revelation of God, with morality. I mean, the people of Annandale looked at this place. They didn't have the law, but they knew what was happening here was wrong. The people of Annandale, they didn't have the law, but they were staying faithful to their wives and their husbands, and they knew What was happening in the rectory was wrong. And yet a minister of God who had God's law, had the revelation of God, had not obeyed it, was in exactly the same position as the Gentile. Now, from 2.17 to 3.9, it's complex, and there's all sorts of different theories about what's going on. I've been persuaded 
by some work that my friend Lionel Wins has done. He's a le- New Testament lecturer at Moore College. And Lionel, and I've given you the link there on the outline to some of his work, and it opens up a whole book and monograph that he's written on this, but um, he's persuaded me that Paul is speaking here to a Jewish teacher, a synagogue lecturer. And so verse 17, if you call yourself a Jew, not so much the introspect, not so much thinking introspectively about your standing before God, but actually thinking, who are you publicly? He says, verse 17, if you call yourself a Jew, and if you rely on the law, and if you boast about God, and if you say you know his will, and if you approve of the things that are superior being instructed from the law, and if you are a teacher, a synagogue teacher, if you are convinced you are a guide for the blind, a light for those in darkness, an instructor of the ignorant, a teacher of the immature, if you have an embodiment of knowledge and truth in the law, Lionel says Paul is speaking to the teacher in Judaism. You then, you teacher in Judaism, you who teach another 21, don't you teach yourself? You who preach you must not steal, do you steal? You who say you must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who detest idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonour God by breaking the law? And yes, there was a scandalous incident in Rome at about the time Paul wrote this letter. And it was such a scandal, you can read about it in Jewish history from this time. Four Jews had been teaching, four Jewish teachers in Rome, in the Roman synagogue had been teaching the Jewish faith to the Gentiles and they persuaded one super rich Roman noble convert to give a stack of money to Judaism and then they appropriated it for themselves. And it was hot gossip in Rome for decades. And verse 24, you the teacher, when you do the wrong Verse 24, the name of God is blasphemed. Tiberius, he expelled the Jews from Rome and and part of the reason was the name of this church was mud. The name of this synagogue was mud. When the rabbis in the synagogue can't keep their pants on. It's not knowing the law that matters, it's doing the law that matters. And Paul's argument here in the back part of Romans 2 is teaching only works if you can live it. And the Jewish teacher can't live it. The Jewish rabbi can't live it. Verse 25, circumcision benefits you if you observe the law, but if you're a lawbreaker, your circumcisions become uncircumcision. It's a nothing. I mean, whether or not you had a bit of skin cut off, the critical thing is do you obey? And the, the brutal answer is they don't. They don't, they can't. So, chapter 3, 1, is there any advantage in being a Jew? Well, yeah, 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 there is an advantage. But the only advantage is you have the knowledge of the words of God. 3, 1, what advantage does the Jew have? What is the benefit of circumcision? Considerable in every way. You're entrusted with the very knowledge of God. When, um, when I became a Christian, I became a Christian as a 20-year-old. And I, I mean, I hadn't grown up going to Sunday school. I hadn't grown up going to kids' church and youth group. And suddenly I, I started to have friends. Some of them had just become Christian from non-Christian world like me, but some of them were Christians who, who'd grown up in Sunday school. Some of them grown up in kids' church. Some of them grown up in youth group. And I remember going away sometimes and We'd be washing dishes together or something like that and they'd start singing some of the kids' songs that they'd learnt in Sunday school and they would tell stories of being in Sunday school and learning the words of God and, and I think I never had that. And, and I think now of the young adult who comes to Christ as a 20-something but they've had 20 years of Bible. And all that teaching suddenly clicks into place. What advantage of being from Sunday school? What advantage of being from youth group? 
for you've grown up with the very words of God, verse 2 of chapter 3. But, I mean, actually, if you've grown up with the very words of God and you never trusted Christ, well, there's no benefit because it's trusting Christ that matters. So, I mean, in terms of standing before God, is there any benefit in being a Jew? No. No. Chapter 3, verse 9. Are, are we any better? Not at all. We've already charged Jews and Greeks are alike under sin. There's no better, no advantage. I mean, here's the thing, though. The controversial bit of this is we knew the Gentiles were under sin. Nobody's disputing that. The controversial bit is that the Jews, too, are under sin. The Jewish moralist is under sin. The Jewish education system, it does not work. Because even the, the rabbi can't live consistently. So conclusion. And I mean, I've taken on a journey of complexity and there's kind of a bit of me that wishes I'd skipped everything else and just started here and taught there because here's where it all gets crystal clear. What he does, verse 10, there's no one righteous. He says, as it's written, summary verse, as it's written, and he picks up six verses from the Old Testament, rolls them all into one long quote. As it is written, there's no one righteous, not even one. Interestingly, and this will be significant, just remember this point for next week. In the Old Testament original there from Psalm 14, it has there's no one who does good. And Paul varies the quote and says there's no one who is righteous. Next week it's going to be all about what is it to be made righteous by God. And so that's a key word for next week. And, we'll, and we'll, we'll see next week to be righteous is the standard of what it is to be acceptable to God. There's no one who is righteous, no one who understands. I think what's happening there is, he says, people are willfully suppressing the knowledge of God. No one who seeks God in and of ourselves. They're not looking for God and I'm not looking for God. All, verse 12, have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Here's the negative role. Five sins of speech. My speech, my throat, my tongue, my lips, my mouth. They're all out of line. The Jewish education system has it wrong. The Jewish teacher has it wrong. The Jewish rabbi has it wrong. Their throat is an open grave. There's an internal corrosion in their in their throat. There's a deadly effect. They deceive with their tongues. Viper's venom is on their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Five, five descriptions of what's going wrong with my speech, my teacher's speech. And then the focus turns to my actions, 15. Their feet, swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths. The path of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now, when you look up those quotes in the Old Testament, all of those quotes from the Psalms are directed at Jews. Primarily in focus is the Jew. He almost primarily in focus is the leader of the Jew. And yet here this, these targeted quotes are broadened to apply to all. And then see, if it's true of this group, it's true of this group, it's true of all. Whatever we know, verse 19, we know that what the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law, the Jews, so that every mouth might be shut. Everyone up. Everyone, the whole world might become subject to God's judgment. Every moral Jew, you are unrighteous. And if every moral Jew is unrighteous, then of course everyone is unrighteous. For no one will be justified in God's sight by the works of the law. Because through the law, we get knowledge of sin. What I find out from the law is that I'm a sinner. Well, that's what the law does. It makes clear to me I'm a sinner. So bottom line of today's passage, and I'll take questions and comments in a moment on the, on the web page you checked into the building on. There's a little thing there on your phone and you can just type in a question. But bottom line is no one's righteous before God, not even Jewish moralists. Now, actually, I don't think there are many Jewish moralists here this morning. But there are still 
quite a few moralists here this morning. Despite my Tim Winton illustration at the start, despite those series of parallels, you're like this, but I'm like this, there's still a temptation to think my family's a nice family. My marriage is a nice marriage. We're acceptable. We're proper people. We're kind of Australians of the year. Those people over there, when I worked on the North Shore as a student minister in a church, I felt this vibe really prevalently. Um, But I'm not naive enough to think it's not here as well. To think, oh yeah, those drug addicts over there, they need the gospel. Those criminals, they need the gospel. People in Cabramatta, they need the gospel. But we, we're quite good here on the North Shore or in the inner west. No, no, no. We are stuffed. We are completely unacceptable to God. No one is righteous. Not even one. Not even the extreme possible best case of the synagogue teacher. Now, I said it was going to be a negative talk. Um, That's the bad news. He said, have you got any good news for us today, Dominic? No. (laughs) No. 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 But I just will show you. Just look at verse 21, the first two words. But now. But now. Everyone's stuffed. But now. A righteousness from God has been revealed. To which the law and the prophets testify. A righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Years ago, I was invited as a guest speaker to a church. And I gave a talk on the um, passage we're going to look at next week. And I finished my talk and sat down. And the minister of the, the church stood up. And said, well, it's been a good night at church tonight. Dominic has shown us the most beautiful butt in the Bible. (laughs) That's next week. The most beautiful butt in the Bible. We've spent a whole week spelling out the problem. The solution next week. God's free, generous gift that I don't deserve. So questions and comments in a moment. But let me lead us in prayer. Father God, we acknowledge we are not right before you. That we are unrighteous. Sometimes our unrighteousness is manifest in our flagrant sin. Sometimes our unrighteousness is manifest in our pride. Give us clarity here, Lord. Help us to see ourselves as who we really are, as unrighteous and in need of your righteousness. Help us to see the dead end of us pursuing self-righteousness. Rather, Lord, help us to throw ourselves on your mercy independence on you. Help us to trust you. And we pray that next week we would hear of that righteousness with a clarity, with a freshness, with a newness, with a dependence. And we pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Ask Liam to lead us again in this song and then we'll come back and we'll tackle any questions and comments that you might have from what's been raised this morning. Let's stand. Please stand as we respond in song.
love is deeper than the depths of sin and hell. He who was enthroned in glory came to bring us to himself. My Redeemer's love is wider my sins had made he reached down into my darkness he alone has power to save This enemy, he will hold me in the tempest. Through the flood, he carries me. My redeemer's love will lead me through the deepest valley. Here. He will shepherd me and guide me. those chapters quite freeing in many ways, Dominic, because mm. I feel if it was left up to us, we'd be even more stuffed. So. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, that is true. If he, if he says, you cannot get there, well, actually, yeah. oh, I cannot get there. So we're all yeah. in the same boat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, this is, yeah, tricky one. Um, so this person says, deep down, it can actually be easy sometimes to become a moralist because of personal hurt, um, pastorally, 
How could we work through this to show grace and forgiveness to those that who, who have hurt us? Mm. Um, so the question says, um, it's easy to become a moralist because of personal hurt. Um, I, just speaking for myself, I find myself slipping into mor- being a moralist for a squillion different reasons. And I find myself kind of willing to give me a pass to look down my nose at somebody else. And any reason will work for me to have a pass to look down my nose at somebody else. It doesn't need to be a good reason, and yet this person is giving a good reason, personal hurt. But what do I do? Well, I think I need to attempt to stand next to them for a minute, attempt to think myself into their situation, and I find the easiest way to think myself into their situation is to think myself into the Lord Jesus' situation. And when I think of the Lord Jesus, I'm reflecting that he, Jesus, this is Hebrews 4, 15, our high priest is able to sympathise with our weaknesses, for he was tested in every way, yet was without sin. I think of that person, well, they got tested and perhaps they were tested in a different way to me. Probably, actually, if I was tested in the same way they were, I would have sinned in exactly the same way that they did. Um, And yet the Lord Jesus was tested in every way and yet he did not sin. And so, um, for me, I want to look at Jesus and then think, oh, he was tested in every way, yet he didn't sin and he looks at me who is so wicked and extends that grace to me. So that's the, that's the kind of conversation that goes on in my head when I play that out. Yeah, yeah. and that leads really well into our, um, our last question. Um, is there a temptation for those of us who do understand the grace of God to downplay sin? If so, how can we desire to flee from sins, both, sins, both small and large? Yeah, well, I'll just say, again, speaking personally, um, I downplay sin... Actually, I downplay my sin. I don't downplay yours. I downplay my sin. (laughs) I'm quite well aware of how sinful you are. But for me, I just rationalise mine away all the time. Yeah. Um, And so, actually, I've got to look at it and say, no, 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 Dominic, you are wrong. You are wrong. You better come next week and hear that good news (laughs) because you really need to hear that next Sunday morning because you don't want to leave yourself down the hill that you are, down the down the valley down the mine shaft <laughs> that, that we are this Sunday morning so look forward to seeing you at church in church next Sunday morning thanks for being with us let's sing our last song <laughs> Please stand. All my attempts to be satisfied were vain and Until the moment you rescued me And your love filled me My soul sings Now my soul sings What blessed assurance I found in you I found in you shaken, I will not be moved. How steadfast your strong hand is keeping me, is keeping me. I won't be shaken, I will not be moved. Oh, blessed
blessed assurance. No other love that I've ever known compares to you, God. No other love that I've ever found has done. soul sings now my soul sings what blessed assurance I found in you I found in you I won't be shaken I will not be moved how stay Fast, your strong hand is keeping me, is keeping me. I won't be shaken, I will not be moved. Oh, blessed assurance. some pretty bad news. Actually, it was like the baddest news. It's like the baddest news you could ever get, right? But and some... you um, used to work in the news, didn't you? I used to work. Or do you still? Maybe still do. I still, I still, still, do. I still bring the news sometimes, <laughs> and, but that's shocking, that news. Um, something great, though, that you might want to not just consider but chat about over morning tea or throughout the rest of your week is that there is good news, and you don't have to wait till next week when Dominic talks about it to discover that good news. You can discover that good news right now. Just flip forward a couple of verses or look other parts of the Bible and see the good news that's offered in the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. Mm. That is great news and well worth not just considering but living by. Mm. And you won't just be hearing about it from Dominic next week, but actually uh, we're really excited to have one of our student ministers, Damien Clark, opening up. What's Damien doing? Yeah, so Damien's bringing the good news next week. Um, So looking forward to that. Um, That's coming up. Also coming up in about 10 minutes' time, if you're a parent um, thinking about baptisms or dedications for your kids, 10 minutes' time, um, just pop down over the side here and, um, yeah, Dominic will walk through and it'll be a time for questions um, for that as well. Um, Or if you're an adult thinking about baptism or confirmation um, head over to phyllischurch.sydney forward slash community just head there today there's lots of stuff coming up make sure you also register for the feast coming up before we head off to enjoy morning tea and thank you again for joining us on the live stream sorry you can't be here for morning tea but if you were here you could join us for morning tea those who are here please join us for morning tea before we finish would you please join me in prayer heavenly father i just ask that all of us feel the weight of the awfulest news around, that we are not righteous, none of us before you, but, but 
May we feel the incredible joy and uplift and freedom that comes from salvation that's found in your son and your son only, Jesus Christ. And may we all know that and live by that. Amen. Have a great week.